I am super excited for today's video, guys. Today we're doing something that I've been wanting to do ever since getting this channel started several years ago. Today we are going to be working with a commercial brewery, collaborating together on a recipe, and then brewing that recipe on a full-scale batch, a seven-barrel batch. Not only am I gonna be brewing this one with them on their system, but I'm also gonna be brewing it on my system, and we're gonna see how the homebrew scale beer compares to the professional scale beer, how the recipes work together, and maybe there'll be a difference in the beer it might be quite interesting. I think this is as close as you can get to an experimental clone beer if you know all the secrets and all the recipe. So it should be a lot of fun. The beer we're making today is a hazy IPA using 100% New Zealand hops. So we're gonna be using Rakao, Nectaron, and Waimea. The brewery I'm gonna be working with is called Twisted Fate Brewing, and they're out of Danvers, Massachusetts, which is not too far from here. This is actually really cool because Dave, the head brewer over at Twisted Fate, is actually a longtime channel viewer. And actually, he's been watching my channel since before it even took off in the past pandemic. This is way before he even started the brewery. They're coming up on their two year anniversary now and it's awesome that he's coming around and saying, hey, let's bring Steve on and do this thing together. Dave is actually running a three and a half barrel system so he has to do a double brew day to get this up to a seven barrel batch size. Um, but I'm gonna be hopping in for the second half of that brew day and they're gonna help him out and see how it goes. I've actually brewed on three and a half barrel systems before. I just never took my camera equipment with me, so it's not an unfamiliar thing to me, but everyone's brewery is a little bit different. So it's gonna be exciting to see what he's got going and uh, how we're gonna do this together. I will be publishing the full video on the recipe that we came up with in next week's video. So you'll get to see the homebrew version of that there in that video if you wanna make it for yourself. But regardless, it should be really fun to see how the homebrew version in this video stacks up to the pro version and uh, uh, just what we can learn from that. And of course, if you're local to the Massachusetts area, please come on down to Twisted Fate Brewing in Danvers in the next couple weeks after this video drops and taste the beer for yourself. Let us know what you think about it. I'm here with Dave, who is the uh, partial owner, head brewer here at Twisted Fate Brewing Company in Danvers, Massachusetts. What's the story behind Twisted Fate Brewing? How did you come to be where you are right now? So I started home brewing um, probably about 10 years ago at this point. And you know, it was always a dream to open up a brewery. In the pandemic, I was a teacher, I got laid off. I went to my wife and uh, my sister and brother-in-law and I said, now's the time, let's do it. We had talked about opening a brewery for multiple years. Um, so it just seemed like the perfect time to, let's, let's do it, let's jump in. The selection of beer styles at Twisted Fate is pretty diverse with about 12 taps, although there's a pretty high favorability towards uh, hazy IPAs and some pastry stouts as well. Twisted Fate, however, almost always has a Pilsner on tap, uh, as well as an Irish stout on nitro. For the most part, Twisted Fate's most popular beers are their hazy IPAs and their Pilsner. Every beer I tasted while I was at Twisted Fate was absolutely fantastic and very, very well made and taken care of. And I can confirm their hazy IPAs can certainly stand up to the fierce competition for that beer style here in New England. What's your favorite beer you have on right now or that you make and why is that the case? I guess I would say my favorite beer is our German Pils, uh, Papa Pils. It's nice and it's crisp, still got a little bite from the hops, it's just very easy drinking. Uh, I can have, you know, a few of them and not have to worry about driving home. <laughs> I, I would have to go with our Pils. Awesome. Yeah. I can agree, it's a very good beer. Thank you. There's a lot of competition out there in the brewing industry, there's a lot of uh, kind of flux, I think, in the craft beer world now. Do you have any advice for people who are trying to get into it, who are trying to, to start their own small brewery or, or thinking about doing it? You know, it's a lot of work, but it's very rewarding. I get to say I make beer for a living, which is an, an amazing thing. We're a family run business, so it's great working with my wife. I work a lot with her behind the bar. I work with my sister a lot uh, and my brother-in-law. 
brother-in-law makes a lot of contributions as well. We're all invested in this, so it's great having the ups and downs, there's the ups and downs, having to share that with, with all of them. It is a lot of work if you're thinking about starting a brewery. You know, someone once told me, you're gonna work your ass off, you're going to, but you know, it is very rewarding. Make sure you have all your, your ducks in a row, a lot of planning, and expect a lot of things that you didn't expect. Twisted Fate Brewing is a nanoscale brewery, which is producing only a few hundred barrels of beer per year. Dave and his assistant brewer Ashley brew on a three vessel, three and a half barrel electric Blickman brewing system. And for the fermentation setup, they have several jacketed conical unitanks from Alpha Brewing Operations, both in three and a half barrel size and seven barrel size. So they have the flexibility to brew either single or double batches, depending on the popularity of a beer style. Two years in now, congratulations yeah. by Thank the way. You. Yeah. Uh, how do you look at things now versus when you started? What are some things you think you might have done differently? Uh, and what are some things that you've started out doing that are you're still doing, perhaps, that uh, have really been good things for you? I mean, some of the things that I think we would have did differently are, um, you know, equipment issues or equipment purchases, maybe we needed more things, we didn't need some things. None of us had any experience working in a brewery, so we were basically going off the knowledge of all my home brewing experience. So a brewery is run kind of like a home brewery, uh, which is great. Things that have gotten easier, the brewing has actually gotten easier. We have our <laughs> procedure um, and our routines that you know we're dialed in on, it makes the brewing process that much easier. We know when we're brewing, it's gonna be fine. We're gonna have beer at the end. We're gonna have good tasting beer. Um, so that's one less thing that actually we have to worry about. Everything else we have to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> A few weeks prior, Dave and I met and came up with our recipe together. The recipe we came up with the beer is really cool. It uses Raquel, Nectaron, and Waimea as the primary flavor and aroma hops. However, there's a small amount of sots going into the mash hops to unlock bound thiols. This is something that Dave does with pretty much all of his hazies, and it's something that adds a whole new dimension of flavor to the beer. Mash hopping is Dave's preferred approach to get thiols into the beer, as opposed to something like Phantasm powder or thiol powder, uh, simply because it is a little bit easier to clean up. In addition to the thiols and the extremely tropical fruity New Zealand hops, uh, the malt bill on this beer is actually a little bit different than you might expect. We have the standard roughly 30% flaked grains in there to get that extra body, that fluffiness, that mouthfeel, and that head retention, uh, as well as the haze. And on top of that, we're going to be using a mix of Pilsner and Pale Malt, specifically Belgian Pilsner and Belgian Pale Malt, to get the rest of the fermentable sugars out. And then on top of that, we're adding a touch of a caramel malt, in fact, to get a little bit of an orange color and a little touch of sweetness on there. Do you have any tips for uh, people who have been in the industry for a while and are kind of getting a little burned out? Do you have any way, like things that you use to keep your passion for brewing alive and your, your excitement for the beer alive? So we've been exploring um, a lot of collabs. We did a bunch of collabs recently. Uh, I reached out to you to do this kind of collab. Always trying to do something different, maybe brew a different style we never brewed. We focus a lot on IPAs, but there's so many different hops, there's so many different variations. We can make a new beer, even though it's a New England IPA, we can make different variations of that. So experimenting with new hops is something, you know, we've been experimenting with Nectaron a lot which has been great, you know, taking and making new recipes involving that. There are other hops. Today we're making a New Zealand IPA, which I haven't really used um, a lot of those hops. Um, so, you know, exploring different hops, different, even different grain, different yeast, you know, playing around with things. Like I said, again, at the end of the day, we make beer, which is an amazing thing. So uh, at this point, not burnt out at all. Um, you know, I love making beer. The brewing process at this scale is still certainly very similar to home brewing, although very much scaled up. Instead of mashing in with like 10 to 15 pounds of grain, instead you're mashing in with several 55 pound grain pegs uh, and several hundred pounds of grain overall, which takes quite a long time. You're still adjusting water chemistry, although instead of adding a few grams of water salts, we're adding roughly a pint glass worth of brewing salts. pH checks at this level are very important as well to ensure not only consistency, but also the best possible flavor from this beer. 
At this level, efficiency in the brewing process is a lot more important than it would be for a home brewer. So a three vessel system is gonna be a lot more efficient than the brewing process that I'm used to, and thus there is a sparge. The sparging process is pretty simple. It's a fly sparge uh, and gets the job done pretty well. Just like many home brewers, wort is transferred from vessel to vessel via pump. However, brewery pumps are quite a lot more powerful and much, much larger, of course, than home brewing pumps. The other thing that scales at this level is heat up times. Uh, even though Dave's electric system is significantly more powerful than my 240 volt homebrew system, it still takes about an hour to get from the mash to the boil uh, in terms of raising that temperature. The other thing that scales at this level is cleanup. If you've never grained out a mash tun before, it's a lot of fun, but it's also a ton of work. One of my favorite parts about the commercial scale brew day though is the hops actually. Not only are the hops scaled up to a point where there's so many that are going in, but also I think they're of a higher quality than what's available for home brewers. When we dropped our Whirlpool additions in for this beer, the smell that filled the brewery was absolutely amazing and it was actually so much more intense than I got at any level for home brewing. Um, and I think that has something to do potentially with the quality of the hops, but also with the scale. And it's just something that's super fun when you're dumping in a bucket's worth of hops as opposed to just a few ounces at a time. Just like on my homebrew setup, once the Whirlpool is finished, you knock out going through the heat exchanger, which is again, just a scaled up plate chiller basically, before going into the fermentation vessel. These heat exchangers are really effective, they're really efficient, they get the work chilled down, no problem in one pass going into the fermenter. For the yeast pitch in this beer, we're using an entire brick of London Fog dry yeast uh, from White Labs. Dry yeast is a little bit more cost effective for breweries, and if you know how to use it properly, it doesn't really have a major impact on the final beer versus using the liquid version of the same yeast. Pitching an entire brick of yeast into this thing was really fun uh, because it's just so much yeast and it's so much wort and it's, it's awesome just knowing that it's gonna turn into beer in a few weeks. While I couldn't go back to the brewery to film either of the dry hopping sessions, Dave was able to actually do it uh, on his own. So you get to see what a dry hop looks like on a commercial scale. Of course, the first dry hop is simple because active fermentation is still going on and there's no risk of oxidation, so the hops just get dumped in. For the second dry hop though, care has to be taken to keep oxygen out. Dave uses a hop dropper type device to both purge the hops of oxygen and prevent any oxygen from getting into the beer as they are dropping in. A few short weeks later, both my version of the beer and Dave's version of the beer were both ready, so we came back to the brewery to taste them together and have a release party. All right, Dave, good to be back. Here we have the uh, commercially brewed Misty Mountain Hops, and here we have my home brewed version of it. And I can tell already there's kind of a slight difference there in terms of color and uh, looks like kind of like in terms of um, opaqueness as well, I think. Yeah, I would agree. It looks like your beer poured with a really solid head on there and mine didn't really build up as much of a head, but it looks like the surface layer is pretty much the same. Uh, you might have a little bit more lacing on the glass there, but that's always tricky kind of canning off of the tap. Sometimes I find you lose a lot of carbonation when you do that. So I'm still perfecting that process. What um, level did you go to for your carbonation? 
So I don't have a zone, so I can't yeah. like really uh, fine tune it specifically, but I tried to go for like usually two to 2.5 okay, for yeah. the most part. Kind of go on the low end sometimes with these. In our packaging okay. process, we lose a little bit. Okay. So we go to like two six. Okay. Uh, and that usually gets us to about two four. Well, let's go in for aroma. Yeah. It's smell very similar. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I'm actually the worst when it comes to the descriptors. Oh, no worries. <laughs> That's totally fine. But I'm getting, I get a lot of tropical fruit, stone fruit. It's candied something in the background. It's, yours is probably a little bit colder than mine too yep. right now because yep. I just drove up here. So I wouldn't be surprised if there's a little bit less aromatics coming off of it right now. Um, but yeah, I get very much the same thing. Yeah, it's some dankness to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, from our experimenting, Nectaron gives a lot of dankness. Yeah. We make almost an all Nectaron uh, IPA, and it was just like, we'd be in Florida, <laughs> blown in your face. <laughs> so we packaged this last week, yep. uh, last Friday, so it's actually mellowed out over a couple of days. And I think mine is only three days older than yours. Okay. And I think I followed the exact same routine and timelines that you did. They smell very, very similar. Let's see how they taste. Sure. Which one are you doing first? Um, I'll do yours first. That's awesome. I'm getting like um, a lot of uh, pineapple and um, okay. like peach. I okay. Think. Really nice malt um, flavor coming through on yours. I get like a, a really nice crackery kind of character. It's really cr cr creamy. Mm -hmm. um, Real which, soft and fluffy. Yeah, yeah, which is great. Yeah. Um, the body is, is, is excellent in my opinion. Yeah. This is really drinkable. Yeah. Like, so it turned out at 7%, yeah, right? Yeah, 7%, 7 okay. percent, so. Yeah, I screwed up my volume calculation and ended up at 6.5. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's light on the hop flavors. Yep. It's it's definitely, I would, I would like a little more hop punch yeah. uh, in the flavor. I mean, it's on the nose, but. I had the same thing with mine. If I was to tweak it a little, I, I would add a little more hops to the Whirlpool. But the aroma is there. It's crushable. Yeah, no, I, I'm actually really impressed at how much I've already consumed of this. I mean, like at seven percent, this is very drinkable, very, very soft in the mouth, very uh, pillowy. I really like the way that it feels. Um, I get a, a good balance. I'd say it probably feels more of like a pale ale to me. Okay. Uh, in terms of like the the hoppiness that I expect, I yep. suppose, relative to the aroma. But I'd say the same exact thing about mine. Yep. Because you'll find when you taste mine, I think it, it also doesn't quite match up to what you expect from the aroma. Okay. But let's jump into yours. Very similar taste. Yeah, yeah. Surprising, but it shouldn't be surprising. Uh, yeah, that means it worked out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly what we were hoping it would happen, to be honest. Yeah. Um, the only noticeable difference right now is definitely the color, but the smell is there the same. Uh, flavor is basically the same. Uh, both, both are very good, crushable. I think, I think the reason why mine might be a little bit darker is if you look at these two really closely together, you can kind of see there's like a translucency to mine and there's a little bit more opaqueness to yours. Yeah. And also I used a different monster for that little tiny bit of crystal. Yep. So that might have been a little darker. Yeah. But um, overall, I think they taste extremely similar, like you said. Like yeah. it's, it's actually kind of crazy. Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> Which is really cool because this is like as close as you can get to a clone recipe. Yeah. I think, you know, if you know all the details, all the processes. Exactly. Do you yeah. think there's any like pungency difference in the hops? Do you think there's any like difference between homebrew hops versus One, pro? I know it's, it could be in my head, but 100%. Uh, the first time I opened up a bag of commercial hops, it was like in my face, like I've never smelled it, like yeah. anything before. Which kind of makes sense on a business aspect, if that's true, if home brewers are getting kind of the leftovers. Yeah. I have no evidence to prove that. I, I feel like when I had a bucket full of hops in my face, you know, and I was up at the end of the Whirlpool, that certainly was a much more aromatic experience yep. than I'm used to. And maybe that's just the amount of hops, but also I think it could be, could the, be that too, could yeah. be the quality. No, I'm really glad we could do this. I'm really glad it could yeah. uh, work out. And we got such similar beers minus appearance. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. thank you. The release party was an awesome time. I had a really fun time meeting a bunch of people and getting good candid feedback on the beer that Dave had on tap. So 7% does not taste like a 7%. It's very dangerous. Color is amazing. The taste is very smooth. 
Oh, that one's better than this one. Okay, I don't know. I'm really bad with beers, but no, I'm worries, not, yeah. I've never been a beer person, but like I would come and order this again. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, it's delicious. Honestly, I'd rather you, you like give critical feedback because then we don't. I'm not gonna lie, that is freaking delicious. Yeah. That is insane. Awesome. The citrus in the beginning yeah. is so good, and then it's such a smooth finish. Like I don't like the hops aftertaste. To convince my wife who hates IPAs to enjoy an IPA, you got you got a winner there. You got a winner. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna get. Oh yeah, we're gonna drink one right, right now. Awesome. Dude, that's insane. That's Thank really you. freaking good. I'm proud to like it. It's one thing to share your homebrew with other folks and to see them enjoy the beer and enjoy that experience, but it's a whole other thing to help make a full-size batch and then also at the same time see the satisfaction that is on people's faces, see the fact that they're enjoying that beer, and you know that it's going to do the same thing for hundreds if not thousands of other people. That is what's so cool about this experience. I'm so grateful to Dave and the rest of the Twisted Fate team for allowing me to come in and work on this project with you and inviting me to do this collab. This was so much fun and I certainly got a ton out of it. And of course, if you're still watching this video, make sure you take a trip on up to Twisted Fate Brewing in Danvers and try this beer. Let me know in the comments section if you do and what you thought about the beer and certainly let Dave know while you're there that I sent you. All right, last thing, you have any words for anyone who's watching? Home brewing, brewing, it's the greatest, it's the greatest hobby greatest job in the world. Keep after it, you know, ex experiment with different things. And, um, you know, there's a million videos out there to watch. There's a million books, articles. Um, so there's always something that can pique your interest to change up a recipe, try a new technique. Um, and at the end of the day, you have beer to drink after you're done. Keep the passion for it and, you know, good luck with everything. Awesome, well, thank you, appreciate yeah. it. Cheers. Cheers.